Welcome to Prepare to Care, the AARP podcast that provides resources and tools to support caregivers and their families. Good afternoon. I'm your host, Ed York. To say that the pandemic changed our lives is a major understatement. Many lost their jobs, and that's causing major hardships. Paying utilities and even buying food has become a concern to a lot of Texans, including most of our vulnerable populations. In response, AARP, Texas has donated nearly $18,000 to support food banks across the Lone Star State. Some of those funds went to the Houston and some the San Antonio food banks. Here to talk about the need, where those funds will go, and who can access those services are Brian Green, President and CEO of the Houston Food Bank, and Eric Cooper, President and CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us, and thank you for what you do for our communities. Thank you so much. Now, certainly, let's let's start with what the people really want to know. Is there enough food at both your food banks right now, and will there be food available in the event that we have a second COVID nineteen pandemic? Are your organizations prepared, Mr. Cooper? Let's begin with you. Well, Eddie, thank you so much. You know, Brian Green at the Houston Food Bank and myself are a part of a national network of food banks uh, called Feeding America. And in Texas, there's actually 21 food banks serving all 254 counties of the great state of Texas. And we just have the privilege of representing the best two cities in the state. Uh, And, um, you know, we are always anxious about having enough food Um, in the COVID-19 environment, our food ranks across the state literally doubled in demand for us here in San Antonio. We went from feeding about 60,000 people a week to 120,000 people a week. And so uh, we've been working with all of our donors um, to educate them on that demand. And and whether they're a, a grocery company or a food manufacturer or a foundation or an individual donor, everybody has been rallying to help us stock our shelves so that we've been able to make sure no one goes hungry. Um, But um, it's gonna take a lot of food and the uncertainty of when this crisis will be over and the economy strengthened and our lines shorten. I think none of us know the answers to those questions. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Green, Brian, are we prepared here? Um, first off, I, I always love hearing Eric talk. Not only do I think he's too young to be on this show with us, but uh, he, just, he explains things extremely well. Uh, you know, the other thing I add is, you know, food has, unlike what I thought when, when this first happened, you know, I, I was really worried about would we have enough food? And for the first few weeks, yeah, it was really rough. Um, but unfortunately, when you have an economic disruption, which uh, COVID has also created, you know, that creates uh, supply chain in some cases. Uh, so a lot of the food that was going to be sold to the restaurants, which uh, a lot of the vegetable lines, uh, that, that was their primary outlet. Uh, and even things like meat or dairy that was going to go to the schools. Um, so there have actually been a lot of opportunities for the Texas food banks. And uh, I, I am proud to say Texas has very aggressive food banks about trying to make sure that we grab onto every opportunity that's available to serve our neighbors. And so supply is actually, I think, been our least problem. Um, And I know it doesn't feel like that way to those of us in the trenches every day as we're we're trying to do this. But, you know, the food supply has been been actually pretty good. Um, And unfortunately, because I I, I do see these economic disruptions continuing, it's going to be very difficult for the restaurant industry uh, to get back to their levels of operation. Um, and I think that's going to continue to generate surplus, and that's what the Feeding America food banks mostly rely on. Um, and then in addition to that, where the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has stepped in to, to purchase surplus and made that available. So supply, that's not the issue. Labor is a bigger issue, I would definitely say. And just being able to keep up with what it takes to do the logistics, um, to do this much distribution just day after day after day, that, those are huge challenges. So excellent. So it's, it's good to hear that that the supply is really working for us. And I'm hearing that we really need more volunteers to assist you. 
and deploying the food and to work with those who are coming in. Um, Eric, we saw national television, your lines of folk coming in to receive foods. How's that line doing? Has, has there been any changes? Are there reductions? Yeah, so as I mentioned, for many of the food banks, that, that line was twice as long as it ever had been. Um, and that image on April 9th that was captured at uh, Texas Swap Meet uh, Traders Village where 10,000 cars, 10,000 families came to get food was really at the onset of the crisis. It was four weeks in when many people's final paychecks had, had run out. Um, and, uh, you know, the need has not subsided, but the, the frequency and the number of distributions uh, that we're doing has increased. Um, for many of our food pantries, most of them are coming back online. Uh, all 21 food banks in the state of Texas partner with an amazing network of other nonprofits uh, that operate food pantries that have had to pivot to curbside pickups and um, different strategies to serve their families. Many of those nonprofits that food banks provide food to are run by seniors, uh, all volunteer. And for many of them, the crisis, the virus, uh, um, you know, caused them to, to, to close their pantries. Um, but as, as they felt more comfortable and are able, many of our food pantries are now back online and more distributions are occurring and uh, we're able to manage the line a little more effectively. But I think bottom line, um, there's some early indications that um, the, the lines are, are shrinking a little bit, but um, you know, for us here in San Antonio, we haven't seen too much relief through the stimulus checks or the increased unemployment benefit. It still seems to be at a COVID high and we are, are just hoping that uh, the strengthening of the economy will will start to shorten our lines. So Eric, what's your greatest need now? What can volunteers do to assist you? Uh, Brian, understand that, that you're looking for people to help with the dispensing of food. Eric, what's your greatest need? You know, I would think funding is always the, the biggest uh, demand. Um, and, uh, you know, that we always, I think for all food banks would say, uh, food, time, money, and voice, you know, food through, um, you know, food donations. And as Brian mentioned, there's some interesting things happening in the, in the supply chain that at the moment, uh, food is coming in, uh, time through volunteers, dollars through contributions, but then people raising their voice, you know, uh, the appropriate amount of advocacy um, and, and really helping people understand and, and prayer when appropriate. But, um, you know, ultimately we'd love to get families out of our parking lots and into grocery stores. And the way we do that is by meaningful employment, a living wage, and uh, this COVID economy at the moment just doesn't have the opportunity for all Texans to, to get a paycheck. And so understanding that increasing SNAP by 15% could put more food on the table for families and um, the need for strengthening strategies to feed kids like the pandemic electronic benefit transfer program, which uh, is in effect here in Texas to, to get kids food. But um, it really is those four things that I think we need is, is good advocacy through voice and, 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 and volunteers and financial contributions and food. So. I can appreciate the fact that it's not just about dispensing food. It is about advocacy. It is about governmental changes. It is about uh, reducing our, our needs to make sure that our vulnerable populations um, are safer, are healthier. Ryan, what can we say about Houston? Uh, what are your greatest needs here in Houston? Well, yeah, I, I do think that for our, for our distributions, it, it definitely labor is, is the biggest issue, both in working the food to get it ready uh, and then the work out, out in the field. Um, ultimately, I, I really want to echo what Eric is saying that uh, our, our success is going to be not needing us to do this, um, both as we look at how we're dealing with this crisis and then just as, a, as an economy, um, not needing food banks would be a much better place to be. 
And SNAP, frankly, is a way better way uh, a mechanism for families to be able to meet their food needs. Um, the, it's, it's, it's disappointing how we're having to operate now um, because of the social distancing requirements um, where we're doing these trunk style distributions as the overwhelming model. Um, man, it is, it is very impersonal. Um, it is also, you know, what you're putting in the trunk, the, 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 the family, they're, they're having no choice in this. Um, and is, this is not the best way to be treating people from a dignity standpoint, especially someone when, when they're struggling, but also just from a standpoint of, well, is, is this what they want? And is this what they would buy? And it's so much better if they're able to go to the supermarket, buy the things that they need for their family. Um, and also then having that money flow into the Texas economy. So we really would like to see, um, as we're trying to get through this crisis, make sure that we're maximizing SNAP. Um, and then looking ultimately is what are the circumstances that make it so that somebody, you know, is not able to uh, meet all the needs for their family. I mean, ultimately, that's where we, that's where we have to go. And I think uh, the, the Texas food banks are, are, are very unified in, in, in saying that we really need to, to look at why we're having to serve so many people in the first place. Is there an organized organization or a way that we can tell our, our listeners how to get on that advocacy train? Uh, how can we join you in making sure that the correct policies that are appropriate to put you guys almost out of business, um, where we can join? Should hey. we just call you directly or is there another way to contact the no, advocacy train? Thanks, Eddie. What I'd encourage all viewers to do now is to, to go to feedingtexas.org. Um, you can register there to become a, an advocate. Uh, uh, also, if you visit, you know, the Houston and San Antonio Food Banks websites, just just getting involved um, is critical. Um, and and understanding the issue is, as Brian talked, I mean, um, the COVID-19 crisis just exposed what food banks knew all along. And that was many families are um, struggling and many families uh, uh, are struggling because they don't make enough. Um, I've had the privilege and Brian too, we've, we've been at this work for a few decades. Um, and when I started, there were so many families that we fed that were unemployed. Um, we then got into just before COVID and everybody's working, but the line is still there. COVID's been the crisis that's created more unemployment. But if you think, man, we still had lines um, in an environment where unemployment was at an all time low, um, addressing and understanding that need of, of why um, why there's still hunger and poverty uh, is, is critical to, to answering the question of how we're going to be moving forward um, post COVID. And to make sure, Eddie, that we're real clear on this, the most of the people that food banks have been serving prior to COVID are working. You know, when, when Eric and I started uh, so many years, for me, a little bit more, more years ago, but still decades, um, it, it was mostly unemployed. That is just not true anymore. Our low wage is, is become low wage in these part time jobs and without the benefits. That's become our biggest issue as an economy. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we can rechannel surplus food and we can you know help families. But ultimately, this is a it's a poor stopgap for people being able to, to, to meet their needs. Well, we certainly appreciate both you, Brian, and Eric, for what you're doing and through your food bank organizations. And it's important for us to hear it. It's a much bigger issue than just feeding folk. Uh, right now, it's really about us working to make sure that we, as caregivers, also take care of our elderly and folk who are susceptible to COVID-19. And I want to say, too, that the AARP uh, organization also has tips for those who are stuck in home or not necessarily stuck in home, but must stay in home uh, to quarantine themselves and caregivers. Uh, we want to make sure that you have a plan to take care of those caregivers who must be quarantined. Um, we have a resource guide. We're going to give you our web at the end of this production. And let's make sure that we also help our food banks through advocacy. Gentlemen, what can you say that to our 50 plus community? Um, 
how can we best serve them? How can we best get a food supply and also take care of their health needs? Uh, Brian, let's begin with you. Uh, we, particularly our 50 plus communities, what we're interested in right now. Yeah, so uh, the many of the Feeding Texas food banks do senior, senior box specific programs. Uh, and then we work with also with many of us with, with the Meals on Wheels programs. Um, and it's, it's, it's helpful, um, but you know, ultimately the seniors making, making sure the seniors have enough income um, is, is kind of where we need to be. One of the things that, that COVID is also exposing, by the way, um, you're, you're right now you can, uh, you can take money out of your, like your 401k um, and not pay the, pay the normal penalty. Um, and this is how you know people are helped to able to navigate the crisis. But when you think about the consequences of that long term, um, for how comfortable their retirement will be, is we're robbing even more people of the ability uh, to meet their needs as, as they as they get older. Um, because again, in the charitable se sector, we can help, but relative to the size of the need, we're just we're just not enough. Well, AARP has been very fortunate to partner with you gentlemen and your organizations. Uh, we've been able to provide a 2,500 donation uh, to each group. Can you tell our membership how you plan or have planned to spend or deal with the $2,500? Food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I I tell you, Eddie, it is it is our ability to kind of leverage those donations and 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 magnify it through our food procurement. That uh, is the magic food banks are are always working to do. Um, and I would just add, uh, if there are viewers kind of in the San Antonio area of this podcast uh, that's in that fifty and up category, um, you know that that we care about you. Um, you know that we're concerned about your well-being. All food banks, uh, and uh, that they can call our 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 helpline, uh, visit our website. Uh, we have food boxes that we deliver uh, to folks that can't get out. Uh, we have many distribution sites, as Brian said. Most food banks have a senior food box program, um, but we want to make sure they're nourished uh, and. Uh, this is a, a time when there's a lot of social isolation. Um, food has the power of bringing people together, and uh, we want to leverage that power to make sure uh, those uh, individuals and families uh, get nourished. Excellent. Gentlemen, before we leave, uh, let me say, first of all, thank you. Um, you have our advocacy from ARP. You have our prayers. Um, we hope that our audience is actually taking note of the telephone numbers that we have on our screen, uh, both for San Antonio and Houston. Please give these gentlemen and their organizations a phone call. Please find out how we can donate food, money, and other needs that are there. Gentlemen, before we leave, uh, is there anything that we missed? Is there anything you'd like to say to us? Uh, Brian, let's begin with you. No, just a, a great gratitude. Uh, thank you, AARP, for the donation. Uh, but we have so many senior volunteers um, who make it possible for us to keep doing this work, not only directly with the food banks, but food banks always work in partnership. And so there's always the partner organizations, um, churches, community groups, other you know that are actually out there making good things happen. And we're extremely grateful for all of the support. And that's what keeps us going. Super. Eric, anything else? Man, Brian nailed it. Uh, adding gratitude to AARP for what you guys do to look after uh, folks and and just take care of, of of those that are in those twilight years that have that have served their families uh, and now there's an opportunity I think in those years to serve the community. Statistically, volunteers live longer than people that don't volunteer. So the, the real secret of aging is to uh, um, get involved in the community, continue to serve. And uh, through service, there's a lot of healing powers of, of body, mind, and spirit. And uh, there is ample opportunities across the Texas food banks um, for people to engage and give a little bit of time and, and serve. And you'll live longer because of it. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate both of you and we ask that you be well. 
And to our audience, we encourage you to follow the Prepare to Care podcast. You can receive us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or at www.aarp.org slash Houston PTC. I want to thank each of you for listening. And as always, thank you for caring.